Jesus Christ and in time prophecies from the book of Revelation. A series of study from the Holy Scriptures based on the book of Revelation by Mark Finley. Join us as we follow the vital topics that will be presented on this study, understanding God's messages and warnings on this last days of Earth's history. Jesus Christ and in time prophecies from the book of Revelation. Where can we find certainty in a world of uncertainty? The book of Revelation provides hopeful answers for today, tomorrow, and forever. Join Mark Finley, author and world-renowned speaker, on a journey into the future with Revelation's Ancient Discoveries. I'm delighted that you've joined us again for Revelation's Ancient Discoveries. In this series, we're exploring different prophecies in the book of Revelation. We're unfolding Revelation. Many people come to the book of Revelation and they say it's a book of mystic symbols, it's a book of cryptic images, it's a book of beasts, but yet we're looking beyond simply the externals in Revelation. We're looking at the major theme of Revelation. We've noted so far that the theme of Revelation is that Jesus Christ wins and Satan loses. Really, if you could summarize Revelation in one word, the word would be victory. That is victory for Christ, victory for righteousness, victory for the people of God, victory for the kingdom of God. As we explore Revelation, we see a great struggle, a great conflict between good and evil. I'd like you to bow your heads with me wherever you are, and we're gonna ask the Lord to come and give us divine insight into this book, the book of Revelation. Father in heaven, thank you for the opportunity of knowing you. Thank you for the prophetic word that gives us clarity and reveals light on the road ahead. Thank you that your word dispels darkness. Thank you that your word gives hope. Thank you that the book of Revelation speaks with ever increasing relevance to the world that we live in today about the fact that Jesus has this world in his hands. So grant to us that hope as we study these prophecies tonight in Christ's name, amen. Our topic for this presentation is Revelation's Star Wars Battle for the Throne. Now when you look through the entire Bible, one thing that becomes pretty obvious is that angels are present. From the first book of the Bible, Genesis, where an angel with flaming sword guarded Eden after Adam and Eve were cast out of the garden throughout the entire book of Genesis. We see angels. You go to the book of Exodus, we see angels. Throughout the whole Old Testament, there is angelic presence. David in the Psalms speaks about the angels. He says, the angel of the Lord protects, stands near those that fear God and deliver him. When you look at Psalm 91, it talks about a thousand shall fall at thy side, 10,000 at thy right hand, but it will not come nigh thee the angels of the Lord again become our protectors. In the New Testament, the angel brings a message to Mary about the birth of the Christ child. Angels guide and protect the Holy Family in their trip to Egypt. So throughout the Old and New Testament, you go to the book of Acts and you see angels constantly there. The angel of the Lord delivers the apostles from prison. In the book of Revelation, angels are present in a very marked way. Probably more than any other place in the Bible, we see angels in Revelation. When we look at the message in Revelation, we see angels as actively involved in this conflict between good and evil bringing light to the mind, dispelling darkness. We see angels beating back the forces of hell, but particularly angels are the messengers of God in the book of Revelation. In Revelation chapter one, for example, the Bible says, verse one, we see an angel. This is the revelation of Jesus Christ. I'm quoting Revelation 1 verse 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show his servants 
things as must shortly come to pass and sent and signified it by his angel to John. So in Revelation 1, the angel brings the message to John. Angels are messengers from heaven. When you look, for example, at the entire book of Revelation, you look at Revelation 2 and 3, you have the seven churches and you have the angels of these churches or messengers to these churches. Revelation is a book of angels. Angels bringing heavenly messages. Revelation chapter seven, angels are holding back the winds of destruction, holding back the winds of strife and conflict to come upon planet Earth. Revelation chapter 10, an exciting chapter. We'll spend one presentation later in the series on this chapter. But Revelation chapter 10, the angel has one foot in the sea, one foot on the land. He lifts his hand with a solemn oath and he cries out, time will be no longer. Angels again bringing heaven's message to men and women on planet earth in Revelation 10. In Revelation chapter 14, you start there with verse 6. I saw an angel, another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the seven, ha, ha, having the go, everlasting gospel to bring to those, to preach to those that dwell upon the earth. And then in Revelation 14, you have three angels bringing heaven's message to earth. So angels all through the book of Revelation. What are these angels flying in the middle of heaven? They are heavenly messengers once again. In Revelation chapter 16, again an angel pours out the vials or the judgments of God upon the earth. The angel brings the message of last day judgment and the return of Christ. In Revelation chapter 18, we say, verse one, it says that another angel cries with a loud voice, cries Babylon is fallen, he calls all of God's people out of the fallen, confused, apostate religious system of Babylon. So again, you have angels, but notice their purpose, notice their function. They are representatives of, ministers of, messengers of the eternal everlasting God. Now, Revelation reveals a struggle between good and evil, and we might call this the great Star Wars conflict of the ages. The Star Wars trilogy captured the imagination of people around the world with a fictitious drama of Star Wars out in space, but that only in a very faint way would mirror the great conflict between good and evil, the great Star Wars conflict. Revelation chapter 12 gives us the focal point of that conflict. So let's go there to Revelation the 12th chapter. We see it in verses seven to nine. And war broke out in heaven. Now that's a strange place for war, isn't it, in heaven? Uh, the reason there's war on earth is because there was first war in heaven. War broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought. But they did not prevail. Neither was there a place for them in heaven any longer. So, so the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast out to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Now notice what scripture says. It says that there's this war in heaven, this cosmic conflict up in heaven, that Michael and his angels fight against the dragon and his angels. Now the Bible identifies the dragon as Satan. It calls Satan the dragon and it calls him a serpent. He is the serpent because he deceives. He is the dragon because he destroys. So the devil deceives those whom he's going to destroy and destroys those whom he has deceived. So we see this war in heaven, but that leads us to some questions. Why was there war in heaven? Where did this dragon come from? What are the issues in this controversy between good and evil? What are the issues in this controversy between Christ and Satan? It leads us to some other questions. Why would God ever allow this controversy to take place in heaven? We go to the book of Ezekiel 
and Ezekiel helps us to find some answers. It really helps us to find an answer to the question, did God create Lucifer? Did God create a demon? Did God create this evil angel who battled against the good angels up in heaven? The prophet Ezekiel helps us to understand this. Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 12. Thus says the Lord God, you were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Now notice, God did not create a demonic angel. It says he was the seal of perfection. In other words, God created a perfect being of dazzling brightness. He was full of wisdom. He was perfect in beauty. There was no flaw in this angel at all. He was created perfect by God. He was created as a shining being of iridescent glory by God. You were the anointed cherub who covers. I established you. Now what is this anointed cherub that covers? Cherub again is an angel. Anointed means he was chosen. So Lucifer was chosen. Lucifer was anointed above the other angels as a covering cherub. If you were an ancient Israelite, you would have understood that because in the Jewish sanctuary, in the most holy place of the sanctuary, there was the Ark of the Covenant. Over that Ark of the Covenant, there were two angels that were wrought out in gold. So the anointed angel, or the angel that covered, would have been one of the angels closest to the throne of God. Truth is stranger than fiction. An angel, one of the angels closest to God, betrayed him. One of the angels closest to God lied about him. One of the angels closest to God lied about his character, claiming that God was unfair and unjust. You were the anointed cherub, the scripture says, who covers. I established you. You were perfect in the ways from the day that you were created till iniquity was found in you. So God created a perfect angel. God created this being of dazzling brightness, full of wisdom, full of glory. But yet, God created him with the capacity to choose. God did not create a demon. God did not create a devil. God did not create Lucifer in the sense of creating a being with some flaw, something wrong with the brain that caused him to rebel, not at all. The scripture teaches that God creates all of these angels perfect. One of them called Lucifer. Lucifer means light bearer. It comes from two Latin words, lux meaning light, pharaoh meaning bearer. So Lucifer is the anointed cherub, he's the light bearer. But the Bible tells us what happened. Ezekiel chapter 28 verse 17, your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. How did Lucifer? become this demonic being. It says you corrupted your wisdom. In other words, Lucifer made a conscious choice. God created him with the capacity to choose. God created all his beings with the capacity to choose. You know, let's suppose that you had a child and uh, you could every single evening um, program that child with a computer. Let's suppose the child had, you know, maybe a couple screws in its head and you could just unscrew those screws, take them out, flip top of the head and place a computer chip in so that your child would always obey you. That would be a pretty good idea, some parents say. How many would like a child like that? Don't raise your hand too quickly. Um, and let's suppose that every night you program the child and the child would get up and say, Mother, I do like my oatmeal. I will eat it all. Mother, I will do my homework. Mother, I will pick up my room and not leave one dirty sock around. How'd you like a child like that? Somebody says, oh yeah, that's great. I wish I had a child like that. And how would you like that child to shake your hand with his iron hand? How would you like that child to kiss you on the cheek with their iron cheek? You see, the only way you could have a child like that is if you had a robot. 
And you don't want a robot child and neither did God. You don't want to, ch you, you love your kid. When he gets up in the morning, you're ready to go to work and he jumps on your lap, this little five-year-old, so happy to see daddy, so happy to see mommy, jumps on your lap, puts his arms around you, kisses you, and at the same time spills the milk over your dress or your pants, you see? I mean, I mean, you don't have any robot child. You have a marvelous kid that you wouldn't trade for the world but he has the power of choice. You see, if you take away the power of choice, you take away the capacity to love. And if you take away the capacity to love, you take away the opportunity to be happy. So God, in his far-seeing wisdom, God, in his amazing knowledge, God does not want angelic beings that serve him either because they're programmed to, because that's the way he created them, or because they're forced to. There is no love without choice. And there is no freedom without choice. So God created free beings that could love him based on his character, his character of goodness, his character of righteousness, his character of greatness, his character of love. And one of these beings, Lucifer, decided that he wanted God's position and God's authority. And the book of Isaiah sweeps back the curtain. The book of Isaiah helps us to understand what happened. Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12 to 14. How are you fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? Now notice Lucifer, the light bearer, the son of the morning. We continue. For you have said in your heart, see sin always begins in the heart, before the sinful act, there is the sinful thought. Before the sinful act, there is the corruption of the human heart, the degradation of the human mind. Back to the text. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. The center of pride is I, and Lucifer had I problem. I will ascend into heaven. Wasn't he already in heaven? Certainly he was already in heaven, but he wanted a higher position because notice what he says. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. The throne implies rulership. The throne implies one who is in charge. The throne applies kingly authority. So Lucifer says he has a throne. He's the anointed cherub that covers. He has a responsible position, but he wants something more. He's not content with what he has. He wants to usurp God's authority. He wants to knock God off his throne. He says, I will sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. What's that all about? The Mount of Congregation, of course, was Mount Sinai. And uh, it's from there that God administered his law. So north is, is, a, is a symbol of the law of God. And so it's a symbol of the throne of God. So Lucifer wants to sit on God's throne, administer God's law. The creature wants to have the authority of the creator. The creature wants to ascend above his creator. He does not want to be worshiped. He wants to, he, he, he does not want to worship. He wants to be worshiped. He does not want to be commanded, he wants to command. He does not want to respect God's authority, he wants to exhibit authority. And so the Bible says that Lucifer declares, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds, I will be like the Most High. So his ambition to be like God caused him to begin sowing lies throughout heaven. Lies that made, might have gone like this. God doesn't have your best interest in view. God is not one who loves you. God is a God, Lucifer said, of, uh, a God of vindictive just judgment. He is a God that commands. What has he given to us? And as he began to sow that discord, sow that dissatisfaction, sow that disaffection in heaven, some of the angels began to buy that lie. Some of the angels began to think that the law of God indeed restricted them. Lucifer desired a higher position. Lucifer desired an exalted throne. Lucifer desired rulership and not dominance. Lucifer desired to be like God. Now, 
God has only one weapon, and the weapon that God has is love. First John chapter four, verse eight, what does it say? God is love. See, Lucifer can use lies, Lucifer can use deception, Lucifer can use force, Lucifer can use coercion, but the only thing that God has, the only weapon that God has is love. Now God could have stamped out Lucifer, and God could have destroyed Lucifer, but if God would have done that, the universe would have served him from fear, and they wouldn't have served him from love. So love is the foundation of the very government of God. If you do away with God's love and you give God all power, then he becomes a tyrant with power. If you take away, of course, his power and you only say that God is merciful, then he has no ability to control evil. So God is love. Part of that aspect of God's love is mercy. The other aspect of that love is justice. So there's a conflict in the universe. For the first time, there's rebellion in heaven. For the first time, there's dissatisfaction. Millennials have gone by. There's only been harmony, only joy, only gladness in heaven. But now, in a Star Wars conflict greater than any Star Wars conflict, Lucifer rebels in heaven. The whole universe is thrown into disarray. Lucifer wants rulership, and he's battling God over the kingship of the world. So what is at stake is the rulership of the universe. It's a battle for the throne of the universe. And notice what Ezekiel 28 verse six says. You have set your heart as the heart of God. Lucifer wanted to be ruler and God. As he shared his disaffection and evil with the angels and the other angels, they rebelled against God. Every angel had to make a decision. Every being in heaven had to make a decision. Will we accept the lies of Lucifer? Or will we accept the truth that God is love and has our best interest in view? And you know the decision that those angels had to make in heaven. That decision is one that every single one of us have to make. Because there's not only a battle in the universe, there's a battle in our hearts. It's the battle between good and evil. It's the battle between truth and error. It's the battle between right and wrong. It's the battle between what we want to do, asserting our own authority and accepting the authority of Jesus Christ. You see, in every heart there is a throne in every heart there's a cross. And if self is on the throne, then Jesus is on the cross. If Jesus is on the throne of your heart, then self is on the cross. Lucifer did not want to go through that point in his life where when these thoughts began to rise, that he denied the selfish ambition, rather, that was indulged. Now how would God face Lucifer's challenge? What would God do? How could he face that challenge? Why not eliminate evil before it spread to the other worlds? I mean, why not just take Lucifer, like a little mosquito here, slap him, do away with him, destroy him, kill him, that's over, it's it. Why doesn't he just annihilate him? Why doesn't he just speak the word? Why doesn't he by his brightness, by God's brightness and light, just zap him and he's gone? If God would have done that, the whole universe would have served God from fear and not from love. The whole universe would have felt that if they stepped out of line at all, that the sword of God would come, totally annihilate them. How would you like to live in an eternal universe of fear? How would you like to live with a God that you perceived to be all powerful but not loving. God knew that a challenge had come to his government. God knew that Lucifer had raised questions about his character. And so God made a decision. Let evil play out before the whole universe. And if God allowed evil to play out before the whole universe, then the universe could see the terrible effects of evil, and as the result of that, they would serve him forever as they contrasted the results of evil, as they contrasted the effects of evil with the marvelous, gracious love of God. 
And so God allowed evil to play out. God chose a much, much wiser course. God chose a course that would take time. God chose a course that would require patience. God would demonstrate his love to the whole universe because love always depends on free choice. Love never can, can be coerced. What if husband and wife were married and he then said, I will make you love me. I will force you to love me. Not at all. Husbands win the affections of their wives, not by force, not by coercion, but by the marvelous love to that woman. And when she sees his love and sees his unselfish kindness, his graciousness, his goodness, her heart is touched and she loves. Just like a husband and wife are brought together by love, his love for her and her love for him. And just like love depends on free choice and it can never be coerced, never can be forced, so likewise, our love to God can never be coerced. It can never be forced. So a battle takes place in heaven. And the Bible says in Revelation 12, verse nine, so the great dragon was cast out. That serpent of old called the devil and Satan who deceives the whole world. So the dragon, the all-powerful Satan, the deceiver who deceived one-third of the angels. There is war in heaven, and God cast Satan out of heaven. He was cast to the earth, and his evil angels were cast with him. Now that leads us to another incredible question. How did planet earth become involved in this cosmic conflict? Did God create earth just as a dumping off place for Satan. Did God have a problem? And he said, you know what, I gotta solve my problem. And so I'm gonna cast Satan out of heaven and earth, into earth and I'm gonna get rid of him. Not at all. God had created a variety of worlds. And the Bible says, 1 Corinthians, it says that we're a spectacle unto the world, to angels and to men. In other words, the universal world, angels, the heavenly world, and men on planet Earth. Hebrews chapter one, verse one, talks about the God who created the worlds, plural. And so God creates these various worlds, worlds that are not involved in sin. And as God creates them, every one of these planets or worlds have a choice. God wouldn't force them to serve him any more than he would force angels in heaven to serve him. And so God gave planet Earth a choice. God gave Adam and Eve a choice. He warned them, of course, I'm certain, that of this conflict between good and evil. He warned them of this titanic struggle between Christ and Satan. He warned them of what the evil one had said, and he told them, you can wander freely through this garden, but there's one place that'll be a test, one place that'll make that is a choice for you. Just like all you, the whole universe had a choice, I'm going to give you a choice as well. You, Adam and Eve, will have the freedom to choose, but if you exercise that wrong choice, sickness and suffering and heartache and death are gonna come upon you. So God gave Adam and Eve that capacity to choose. Eve wandered from her husband. And there as she came to the tree, the voice of Lucifer began to speak to her. And he began to sow that lie. And God said to Adam and to Eve, you can eat of every tree of the garden. In other words, he gave them the easiest possible choice. He didn't say you can eat of one tree and don't eat of all the rest. He said you can eat of every tree, but this one tree, this one tree is the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And if you eat of it, your natures will be changed. If you eat of it, you'll open a door for evil to come into the universe. Adam, Eve, listen to me. I love you. I want you to enjoy the garden forever. Do not eat of that tree of knowledge of good and evil. Eve, in her curiosity, wandered from the side of her husband and she came to that tree of knowledge of good and evil. 
And she was surprised because there in the form of a beautiful serpent, now we don't think serpents are too beautiful. We see a serpent, we run the other way. But evidently in the garden, serpents were created just magnificently, beautifully. We can't imagine that, but in fact it is true. And in Genesis 3, verse 4 and 5, you know, Scripture says the devil begins to speak to her. Has God said, you will surely die? You won't surely die if you eat of the tree. Eve speaks, but, but yes, that's what God said. And the devil says, you're not going to surely die. Eat of it. Take it, Eve. Take it. You'll enter into a higher sphere of existence. Look at me. Look at me. Take this fruit. You'll enter into joy and ecstasy and happiness that you've never known. That was the first lie. But the devil's been telling that lie down through the centuries. The devil has been telling people that the way of Christ is a way of narrow restriction that takes away your happiness. He's been telling people down through the centuries that the way of sin is the way of joy, the way of pleasure. And so people are involved in alcohol, they're involved in tobacco, they're involved in the stimulating pleasure that they think is bringing them joy when they're killing themselves, the party life. And then you have to go to one party after another party after another party, it has to be go greater and greater and greater. Now there's nothing wrong with joy and fun, but when you get your stimulation from the things of the world, Rather than the things of eternity, it leaves you with a barrenness, an emptiness of soul. Some people think that sexual immorality and multiple partners will bring them joy when they only end up broken and bruised and barren and empty. At the tree, Satan speaks and he says, you will not surely die. And look at his argument. Genesis 3, verse 4 and 5. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. If you eat this tree, you are going to be like God, Eve. Take and eat it. Eve listening to the voice of the evil one rather than listening to the voice of God took of the tree and ate. And when she did, she opened a door, a door of suffering, a door of heartache, a door of death on a planet called Earth. Adam took of the fruit and ate it. And immediately their natures changed. Immediately they sensed that something was different. After Adam and Eve ate of the forbidden tree, they were filled with guilt. They were filled with anxiety. They had never had an experience like this before. Never before in their lives had they felt so unclean. Never before in their lives had they felt so guilty. Never before in their lives had they felt this separation, this abandonment from God. Isaiah chapter 59, verse 1 and 2 says, Your sins have separated you from God. Sin separates us from God. Adam and Eve, for the first time in their existence, for the first time in their lives, had that sense that now they were separated from God. What, how come there's so much suffering in our world? How come there's so much sickness in our world? How come there's so much heartache in our world? How come there's so much sorrow in our world? Because we live in a planet in rebellion. Not only did Adam and Eve sin, but all of us have partaken of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Every single one of us have sinned. The Bible says in Romans 3, verse 23, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 6, verse 23 says, the wages of sin are death. So put this together. Adam and Eve partake of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They separate from God by their own choice. The seeds of death enter into their body. Every single one of us are born with a nature that is fallen. Jeremiah 17 verse 9 says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Uh, Isaiah 64 verse 6 says, all of our righteousness is as filthy rags. In other words, even at times without Christ, our righteous deeds are tainted with selfish motives. When Adam and Eve sinned, they opened the door of sickness and suffering and death. And what does sin produce? Sin produces anxiety. Sin produces fear, sin produces suffering, sin produces death. 
And right there in that garden, Adam and Eve begin to argue the first time. Uh, they begin to blame one another. Adam blames Eve. Eve blames the serpent. So they begin to play that blame game. This earth is plunged into rebellion. This earth is plunged into that sickness, sickness of sin. It's plunged into anxiety and fear and suffering and death. Disease now takes the place of health. Anger takes the place of kindness. Impurity takes the place of purity. And we live in that planet. What was God going to do? Is God responsible for the suffering, the heartache, the sorrow in our world? Is God responsible for the war, the conflict and strife in our world? Certainly not. You remember Jesus told a parable about this, Matthew the 13th chapter, the 28th verse. Jesus told the parable about the wheat and the tares and he told the parable about a field and there was only good seed sown in it but then when it came harvest time there were weeds and the farmer says, where did they come from? What does Jesus say? Matthew 13 verse 28, he said to them, an enemy has done this, an enemy. So there's an enemy of God and man. That enemy is Lucifer. He led Adam and Eve into sin and he has led every human being into sin as well. Why is it that there's so much natural disaster in our world? Because we live in a planet separated from God. So all of nature is out of control. Why is it? So much war? Because selfishness reigns in the heart. Why is it there's so much divorce? Because rather than forgiveness and kindness and compassion in marriage, very often egotism reigns. You can trace the conflict of this world back, back to that rebellion in heaven with Satan, back to the fall of Adam and Eve, back to the fact that every single one of us have partaken of that forbidden fruit. There is an enemy of God and man. He's called Satan. He's called the accuser. He is called the devil. The Bible describes him with a variety of names. You ask the question though, I thought the devil was a little imp with wings and a pitchfork with a red suit. <laughs> not at all. That's not the picture that the Bible gives. The devil is a brilliant fallen angel that is bent on destroying God's authority over the universe. The devil has ushered in the sickness, the sorrow, the heartache that we see. And he's done that by prompting people to make selfish choices. He's done that by polluting the entire environment in a variety of ways. And so we see a world, we see a conflict between good and evil. We see a conflict between Christ and Satan. We see a Star Wars epic odyssey that is far beyond what anything we could possibly imagine. Lucifer, deceived one third of the angels in heaven and they were cast out with him. Lucifer deceived Adam and Eve on earth and Lucifer is deceiving scores of people today. See, in this battle, there's only one or two sides, righteousness or unrighteousness. Only one of two sides in this battle between good and evil, sin or error and truthfulness. Sin on one side, truth on the other side. Only one of two sides, the side of Christ or the side of Satan, the side of Jesus or the side of the dragon and the evil one and every single one of us every day are making those choices. Adam and Eve made that choice and as the result of that left the Garden of Eden. They left filled with sorrow and grief. They left filled with heartache but they turned again to their Redeemer. Now you say, why doesn't God do something about the evil in the world? If God is loving, why doesn't he step in? Why doesn't he do something? If God is loving, why does he not intervene? Three things, first, God has done something. When Adam and Eve sinned, God didn't push this universe out into the far reaches of space. When Adam and Eve sinned, God didn't say, you've sinned, therefore I'm gonna annihilate the race and I'm gonna start all over again. God came to the garden 
when Adam and Eve sinned. And he said in Genesis 3, verse 15, here you have the first promise of the Messiah, and I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. Then notice, he, that is the Messiah, Jesus Christ, will bruise your head, Satan, and you'll bruise his heel. In other words, Jesus Christ would come. He would pay the ransom price for Adam and Eve. He would live the life that they should have lived. Jesus would come as the second Adam, and there he would live a perfect righteous life. He would face all the temptations of Satan, and he would live and dwell in the flesh, trusting in the Father's power and grace. He would overcome Satan for you and me, and he would go to that cross and he would die the death that we should have died. Why hasn't God done something? He has done something. In the garden, when Adam and Eve sinned, he gave them the promise of hope, the promise that he would come, the promise that he would die on Calvary's cross, the promise that he would send a death blow to Satan's head, that he would crush Satan forever. Jesus came, and he hung on that cross. And he died the death that we should have died. Every drop of blood was for you. And he rose from the dead, alive again to ascend to heaven. The cross reveals the enormity of God's love. You know, sometimes we talk about the cross at Calvary. And sometimes I hear Christians talk about it quite flippantly. A cross around their neck picture of Christ on the cross, cross and churches. But what does that cross really represent? The cross represents all of the sin of the universe heaped upon Christ, all of the sin of this world heaped upon Christ. It represents all of the guilt, all of the shame, all of the condemnation upon Christ. He who knew no sin, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21, became sin for us. Christ suffered the death that we deserve so we can live the life that he deserves. Why doesn't God do something he has? He sent his son, Jesus Christ. He has sent Christ to live the life we should have lived and die the death that we should have died. The Bible teaches the most amazing love story in all the world. Jeremiah 31, verse three, Jesus says, yes, I've loved you with an everlasting love. Jesus does not coerce, he does not force, but before the whole universe, he reveals his love on a cross at Calvary. Christ came. He was born as a babe in Bethlehem's manger. From the time he was born, Satan wanted to destroy him. All through his childhood, Satan wanted to get him to sin. He, Jesus fasted 40 days in the wilderness, and Satan threw his fiercest temptations at Jesus. And on that cross, the devil was screaming in his ears, why don't you give up? Why don't you come back, go back to heaven? He wanted you, the devil wanted humanity to be lost. Why doesn't God do something? He has. Why doesn't God do something? He has. He has sent Jesus Christ to come. He sent Jesus to this world. When Adam and Eve sinned, he promised that the Messiah would come. And faithful to that promise, Jesus came, born as a babe in Bethlehem's manger. Faithful to that promise, Christ hung on that cross. Ephesians chapter three, verse nine, tells the larger reason for Christ's death and to make all see. What is the fellowship of the mystery? What is the mystery? It's the mystery of Christ's love, the mystery of Christ's redeeming grace, the mystery of Christ's goodness, the mystery of Christ's desire to save us. It is the mystery revealed which has been from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God. That mystery of his love is revealed on Calvary's cross who created all things through Jesus Christ. On the cross of Calvary, God reveals how much he loves us. Why doesn't God do something he did? He sent Jesus Christ to pay the ransom price for our sins, to redeem us from the guilt and shame of sin. He sent Jesus. Lucifer challenged 
God's government in heaven. And the answer to that challenge is Jesus himself. We find Jesus on every page of scripture. Jesus revealing God's goodness. Jesus revealing God's love. Jesus touches the eyes of the blind and they're open and that shouts, God loves you. Jesus touches the arm of the withered man and it's healed. That shouts, God loves you. Jesus takes children in their his arms, that shouts God loves you. Jesus raises the dead like Lazarus from the dead. That shouts God loves you. God is not a vindictive judge. God is not a wrathful tyrant. The cross and the life of Christ reveals how much Jesus cares. It was dark, dark Friday. The birds stopped singing. The sun stopped shining. They put him in the tomb that Friday. But hallelujah, Sunday morning came and Jesus came out alive, resurrected from the dead. Why doesn't God do something? He not only has done something, he is doing something now. Christ is alive. Hebrews chapter four, verse 15 and 16 says, we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted like we are yet without sin. What are you struggling with today? Are you in the battle between good and evil? Does darkness at times engulf your soul? Do you feel that the journey is long and the mountain is high? The incredible good news is not only has God done something, but the incredible good news is Christ is alive and he knows our weakness. He knows our frailty. He knows what we are going through and he is there to strengthen. He is there to encourage. He is there to give hope. Jesus never lost a battle with Satan yet and he's not going to lose the battle in your life look up let new joy fill your heart let new courage fill your life the Bible says Hebrews 4 verse 15 and 16 let us therefore come let us do what everybody let us do what let us come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need I don't know what your time of need is are you going through a time of need right now the brokenness of heart your spirit's been crushed. Problems have overflown your life. It seems like you're in a dark cave. Let us come boldly to the throne of grace that we might find grace and help in the time of need. Do you have a time of need right now? Come. Come to this Christ. See, God has done something. He sent Jesus. God is doing something. Christ is alive. His power is yours. His strength is yours. His hope is yours. He will lighten up your darkness and put a new spring in your step and a sparkle in your eyes and a smile on your face. Jesus never lost a battle with Satan and he's not gonna lose the battle in your life either. God has done something. He sent Jesus. God is doing something now and he will yet do something. Revelation 20 verse 10, the devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone. Therefore I brought fire from your midst, it devoured you. What does the Bible say? God will yet do something, eventually. Satan will be destroyed. Eventually, the evil angel that rebelled against God as the whole universe sees God's love, as the whole universe sees God's graciousness and goodness, Satan will be destroyed. The scripture says, Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 18 and 19, and I turned you to ashes upon the earth. You have become a horror. You shall be no more forever. Evil will not have the last word. Jesus Christ will. Wickedness will not have the last word. Jesus Christ will. Sin will not have the last word. Jesus Christ will. Jesus Christ, the one who came, the one who faced the wrath of Satan, the one who faced all of the accumulated results of evil, the one who took every temptation and was victorious, the one who went to Calvary's cross for you and me, the one who bore our sin and guilt and shame and took our sin to the cross, the one who in that most hideous moment of the cross was victorious over Satan, this one, Jesus Christ, this Christ who was resurrected from the 
dead. This Christ who came out of the tomb in glory. This Christ who rose to heaven. This Christ who is there for you and me now to give us hope and encouragement and confidence and joy. This Christ is coming again. This Christ, according to the book of Revelation, will put an end of Satan forever and ever and ever and ever. One day the universe will be clean. One day, one beat, uh, one pulse of harmony and joy will beat throughout the entire universe and all things animate and inanimate will say, God is love. One day, Satan will be defeated forever. One day, Satan will be destroyed forever. One day, Satan will be burned up and consumed like ashes forever. Right now, Jesus Christ says to you, my child, whatever you are going through, grasp the reality of the fact that I love you. Don't buy into Satan's lie. Grasp the reality of the fact that I am there, that I will never, ever, ever let you go. A number of years ago, when I was a speaker for It Is Written television program, international television program, often aired here on Three Angels Broadcasting, uh, many, many years ago, I received a letter. It's probably the saddest letter that I ever received. We used to get about 200,000 responses every year, and my secretary's administrative assistants would read those letters. But one day, my administrative assistant came in to me and she said, Pastor Mark, you need to see this letter. And as I read this letter, it went something like this. Dear Pastor Mark, I've been watching you on television, and I need to share with you an experience that I had. It was a summer day. And I was cooking my lunch for my children. I had two children, five years old and three years old. Pastor Mark, I didn't hear the screen door open in the back. And my little three-year-old crawled out onto the back deck and we had an in-ground sunken swimming pool. My little three-year-old tumbled into the pool. My five-year-old went out to try to help and tumbled into the pool. And Pastor Mark, both of my children drown. I went through darkness and despair. I cried out, God, where are you? Where's a God that would let my kids drown? I blamed myself. I felt guilt. I felt so condemned. Why did I ever do that? Why wasn't I more attentive? Why didn't I listen? Through all of that, I began to read the Word of God. I found that Christ never promises that we won't suffer. We're in a world of evil. We're in a world of wickedness. We're in a world of, uh, of sorrow. We're in a world of tears. He doesn't promise that we'll never suffer. But he does promise that he'll never leave us. He does promise that he'll never forsake us. He does promise, lo, I am with you always even to the end of the world. Pastor Mark, I found Christ in Scripture. I now know what it's like to let Jesus hold me in his arms. I now know what it's like to lean my head upon his breast. I now know what it's like for him to say, my child, one day your tears will be gone. Listen as Tim sings, only trust him, only trust him, only trust him now. Come every soul by sin oppressed, there's mercy with the Lord. And he will surely give you rest by trusting in his word only trust him only trust him only trust him Plunge now in 
to the crimson flood that washes white as snow. Oh, Jesus is the truth, the way that leads you into rest. Believe in Him without delay, and you I don't know where you are, friend, in your spiritual journey. You may be going through something that is extremely difficult for you now. The road that you're traveling on may be a road with a lot of deep caverns, a lot of high mountains, and you may feel engulfed with, with hurt, with pain, with sorrow, with tears, with darkness. But there is one who hung on a cross for you. He wants you in heaven more than you can ever imagine. He loves you more than you can possibly conceive. There is one who's living for you right now. He will give you strength and courage and hope. And there is one that is coming again to destroy all of evil and all of sin and all of wickedness. You can trust him. Only trust him. Only trust him. Only trust him now. As we pray, give him your burdens, give him your heartaches, and trust Jesus just now. Let's pray. Father in heaven, sometimes life kicks us in the stomach and knocks out our breath. Sometimes life gives us a sword through our heart but we're thankful that Jesus is there we're thankful that we can trust him today tomorrow and forever we're thankful that he's there to strengthen us that he's there to empower us that when we're ready to fall he'll hold us up when we stumble and fall he picks us up we're thankful that one day evil will be over and that Satan will be destroyed and we can live with you forever. Keep us trusting you until that day. In Christ's name, amen. Thank you for joining us for this journey in Revelation's ancient discoveries. Continue with us on the journey as we unfold the book of Revelation and reveal hope in God's end time plan. Mm -hmm.